Hello, I'm Brad. Are there ever times where you're just laying in bed and there's just something bothering you that you have to do something and you just you just can't sleep? You got to get up and do it. Well, making a video like this is one of those things that just keeps me all up at night. Educating people about concepts in VR is really important to me these days. With so many new people coming into VR and thinking they know a lot of things, I want to show them that they don't. OK, that, 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 that's that's a little cruel. That's a, it's a cruel joke. But seriously, there is a lot of new people that don't really know a lot of new concepts or older concepts that's been in VR for years now. Wires! Something that the VR community fears with a god dang passion. I mean, look, I bet you there's a few people that are watching me hold this thing and are just literally shuddering right now. Just, just can't take the look of this thing. I get it. Once you go wireless, you cannot go back. There's a lot of things in VR like that. The thing is you have to remember about wires is they are a tried and true method of delivering a lot of data very fast with very little latency. And wireless is nowhere near as powerful as a wire, yet. Despite that, a lot of people in the VR industry have been working very hard to figure out methods to, well, at least make VR more enjoyable to wear without getting tangled with a wire. In this video, I'm going to explain all those methods and how they've come to be, and the future of what I believe the methods will be. The very near future, in fact. And it's exciting, I promise. So, are you ready to learn something new? Or maybe not learn anything at all? Let's see! Grab a beer and let's find out! In my hand, I have the Oculus Quest 2. This is an example of how companies have decided that, well, we can make a device wireless by putting a processing unit inside of it instead of connecting to a wire to a processing unit outward. Obviously, the benefit is, yeah, no wire. And you can have a lot more control over the software and everything that's on it. I think Facebook really likes that part about it, too. But the caveats of this are, well, of course, you're not going to have a very good processing unit and you are limited to something similar to a smartphone processor or GPU. A lot of people new to VR have been really enjoying standalone, but then they start seeing things on PC, for example, and they're like, I really need to get in on that. So then they try to buy something like an Oculus Link cable. And then they realize, wow, I got into VR and got used to not using a cable. What am I gonna do? This sucks. So then they figure out something called Virtual Desktop or AirLink. Since this is basically a glorified smartphone redesigned for VR, it has Wi-Fi 6 radio antennas and pretty good ones at that. So both AirLink and Virtual Desktop use that at its advantage to basically allow a processing unit or PC to deliver a lot of data to play games wirelessly in VR. A lot of people love this system and, and swear that there's literally no difference to wired and um. Yeah, maybe they just are in Stockholm Syndrome. Let me get to that. It's pretty sad I had to say this, but I, I know how people are. So let me just say, if you are one of the people that swear by virtual desktop and AirLink, I am not trashing your way of playing VR. In fact, I think it's great you have such an accessible way to enjoy VR. PC VR, that's good for me too as a PC VR enthusiast. But as someone that believes in a greater future where things can actually be critiqued and get better over time, I am going to trash some of the ways that this method of playing PC VR is still not perfect. God, again, I can't believe I have to go through that, but people will go freaking bananas if I don't. So first to talk about AirLink and virtual desktop, we need to talk about how this works. So Wi-Fi 6 has a pretty good amount of data that can transfer up to nine gigabits per second. However, that is at a pretty high latency compared to what VR really needs to be well, completely healthy. There's also the huge variability of how well your Wi-Fi network may be. Maybe you have a lot of devices on the network. Maybe you have a lot of walls, a lot, just so many factors. You could even have a crap router. You could even have an internet service provider that won't let you change out your router. Router, R router, which sucks. So at its best, 20 milliseconds, which is pretty amazing for the technology, that is not very good. In fact, the next technology I'm going to be talking about after I get through this spiel talks about how greater than 20 milliseconds is actually very bad for motion sickness. But we'll get to that soon. Anyway, so the way it works is a computer is rendering what's being played and compressing it a lot and sending it over a Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 5 if you really will love motion sickness over the network to this thing wirelessly. And again, 
For what that is doing, it's freaking phenomenal. But Wi-Fi 6 at its best operates at 5 gigahertz, which sounds pretty good. And it is pretty good for a lot of things, but transferring a huge amount of data at a low latency is not really one of them. Well, eventually these devices will get higher resolution over time. That method that you're using now may not work as well in a method in two years when a greater resolution headset comes out. I know what some of you are going to say, but Brad, I run my Quest 2 wirelessly at 120 hertz and I super sample it all the way up. Well, there's a huge misconception about that super sampling slider in the Oculus and SteamVR settings for wireless VR that you probably did not realize, and I'm here to help you realize that. So when you bump your resolution per eye up a lot, it is actually not sending any more data to your headset. All that's doing is actually kind of downscaling. What I mean is, imagine you're watching a 4K video on a 1080p monitor. Obviously, you cannot watch a 4K video full screen on that monitor, but it still downscales, and a lot of the times that looks very crisp, especially the edges for anti-aliasing and stuff. And basically, if you're that 1080p image is actually what's being sent to the headset itself. So literally, all the stuff that's done with the super sampling is done on the machine, and then after the down sampling, all that down sampled data is actually being sent to your headset. So no, you're not actually sending that much resolution data to the headset. You're still saying the resolution max at what the headset is running at. Again, this is not to discount the fact that people do this and it works well for them, that's great. But I'm just saying there is some downsides to this and there will be a time where it's outdated. Another thing I brushed up on, but I wanna reiterate, is a lot of the data is compressed heavily by your CPU just to fit over that data network. This is on purpose, of course. That is why you might see artifacting or compression, especially if you ever played PC VR wirelessly with the next product I'm gonna bring up, or even wired, you will notice compression 100%. Of course, your eyes can get used to these things, such as the high latency and even the compression stuff. But again, this system is great for accessibility, but is not perfect. Now it's time for the next product that's actually older than the method that I was just explaining. Do you see this thing that looks like a T-Pose? This is the HTC Vive wireless adapter that came out in 2017, 2018, around then. A lot of people freaking love this thing. It worked very well when it came out for the HTC Vive, which was still pretty much an industry leader in the VR. That's how old it is. I mean, HTC industry leader. Whoa. And it worked again very well for the headset. But then they released the headset that uh, is on my right, the HTC Vive Pro. And they bumped up the resolution to the point where it's actually what the resolution of the index is, but at 90 hertz. And HTC realized, okay, we can sell this product with the HTC Vive Pro. And again, it works. However, you start seeing the weaknesses of this device pretty soon if you use it with the Vive Pro. The Vive Pro clearly uses this thing at its max throughput at all times, and this thing suffers from heat exhaustion constantly. A lot of people that use the HTC Vive uh, with this thing a lot never really had that many blackouts. Some still did, but nowhere near as much as when they got the HTC Vive Pro and started using this thing. And while I do like this device, and I do use it quite a bit with my HTC Vive Pro Eye, and somehow it actually works with eye tracking and mouth tracking, even though this is actually supposed to be a only one-way method for data transfer, I'm very lucky, it still has its issues. So this is running on technology called YGIG, wireless gigabit, also known as 802.11ad. It has a maximum throughput of up to seven gigabits per second. And I already know you're thinking, wait a minute, but Wi-Fi 6 is at nine gigabits per second. Well, there's a big difference. This runs on a 60 gigahertz network. Just reminders, Wi-Fi 6 runs at a max at five gigahertz. So due to the fact that this thing runs at a super high frequency, it allows a lot more data to be sent at once, and that allows for a lot lower latency. On average with this device, users would get around six milliseconds of latency on a normal system. Not only that, is all the data being sent to those headsets with this thing were actually visually lossless, which means there was compression going on, especially when times you would actually be out of sync, which we'll get in a moment talking about that. But when this thing was working at its best, you would have literally no noticeable compression. But what are the downsides of this device? Well, the first thing is this standard that this thing runs on was actually ratified in 2012. That is about six years before this product came out. It really is crazy that it actually became a VR centric product. And now YGIG2, which we're gonna get into, is 
definitely a why a VR centric product. But yeah, 2012 is a long time ago. This device benefited from a technology called beamforming, whereas a Wi-Fi router pretty much sends data all around in like a big circular. Just like how if you had like you grab a big piece of uranium and it would just radiate everything around you. Well, this thing uses like this thing up here. You see that? It's not a web camera. That's part of this thing. Beamforming is literally sending something in one direction to get the maximum throughput into one direction. However, due to this technology and due to it being a very early form of beamforming, uh, there were times where you would actually have issues with occlusion or even if you were not standing directly in front of this little web camera thing, you would even start getting compression due to the signal being slowly lost. That kind of sucks. You know, like you pay a lot of money for this adapter. This retailed for around $300 when it came out. And just to have you kind of stand in one place, even though it was very great wireless VR, yeah, that's still not a beneficial issue. So while I did prefer this thing compared to what the Quest 2 uses now, it still sucks. I'm gonna be honest with you, it, it's, it's outdated. That thing couldn't even be used for this headset, the Valve Index, which even though it's running at the same resolution, the higher frame rate of this device literally made it pretty much impossible to use YGIG1, at least effectively. One thing kind of interesting is literally at the launch party that Game Newell even spoke at when the Index first came out, someone asked him about the wireless situation for this device and if they would ever see a wireless adapter akin to what the Vive had. And he said that the problem was already solved and they should see a product soon. So why did we not see anything for something like the Index or any other higher fidelity headsets. Was Gabe Newell lying? Was he just saying that for press or did they really have something? Well, I have good news. They really did have something. This is what they had. In my hand, I have a patent filed for actually months before the Index came out in January of 2019. It goes on to detail a adapter that would actually be able to use a technology called YGIG2. Wait a minute. That's what the Vive used. You're telling me there's a YGIG 2? Yeah, there's a YGIG 2, but not yet. So before a new wireless standard can be approved or even sold in stores, it has to go through a ton of certifications, mainly to make sure if these wireless signals are not like, you know, rotting people's brains, I'll let it rot my brain. And I believe that Valve and GameNull himself were just literally have the design and every, the product completely ready but the certifications were getting delayed. The actual certification for YGIG2 was actually supposed to come out last year, but that was 2020. And um, I think something big happened that made a lot of things get delayed. But this year for sure, we're supposed to see YGIG2 get its certification. But what is so big about YGIG2 compared to YGIG1? I mean, YGIG1 had problems, how is YGIG2 gonna solve them? Well, I went through all the schematics of what YGIG2's actual standard practices will be, and I went through this patent to explain how Valve is gonna use it. And it actually has a lot of cool ways that will solve all the problems that YGIG1 had. So first of all, YGIG2 is actually running at the same 60 gigahertz frequency that YGIG1 is. But what is the bandwidth for it? So YGIG1 was running at a maximum of 7 gigabits per second. I can only imagine what YGIG2 is running at. Oh my god, 44 gigabits per second per device up to 4 streams. That's insane. Not only is that more than 4 times the actual bandwidth that Wi-Fi 6 can have at lower latency, that is also... God, someone do the math. Seven times more than YGIG1? Not only that, but the actual patents that Valve had for their wireless adapter device that I still believe that Valve is just waiting for the moment that certification's announced and they can release the product. They have another cool thing. I explained how this Wi-Fi sort of beamforming situation had a lot of issues with occlusion, and if you did not walk straight in front of it, it would have issues with losing some signal and stuff like that. Well, Valve figured out that with YGIG2, it uses something called MIMO, which allows multiple streams and choosing which actual antenna to send out data from. So while this has only one, the patent here says up to four different directions can be sent out at once. So Valve figured out that they can use the tracking data from the headset to send directly to the computer and the computer can communicate to whatever new adapter that they're using for the YGIG2 for Valve Index. And based on the location you are in the room, 
the actual antenna pointing to you would change. So not only would this help for a lot of things, including inclusion, it would actually help a lot for making sure you never have a weak signal just by walking to the other end of your room. This makes a lot of sense because wireless VR, its biggest benefit is not being held down in one place. I don't know about you, but I, 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 I really get, I get hot thinking about this. <laughs> I, get, I mean, this, this is good stuff. 44 gigabits. Oh. Valve even had patents showing off some head straps that would probably go on a future Index headset as a, a option or attachment that would include this technology in it. So not only would you have to wear a stupid little T-pose on your head, it would actually just be a, built into the strap around your headset on at least for the Index 2. And the big thing to actually note is this is not something that only Valve could use. Depending on how Oculus sees PC VR in general, they're kind of giving mixed signals right now. They released AirLink because, well, a lot of people, despite the fact they enjoyed standalone, they realize there's a lot of fidelity that PC VR gives. The Steam user surveys even prove that. A lot of percentage of Steam users that have a VR headset plugged in are actually Oculus Quest 2 headset users. So a lot of people are still using PC VR with their standalone headset. And Oculus still sells the link cable, despite now also featuring AirLink for free. So is it possible that maybe in a pro series unit in a few years, we may see such as this YGIG 2 built into a headset itself with a wireless adapter sold separately, similar to how the link cable is sold separately? Possibly. It depends what direction they want to go. What I'm just trying to say is that when this certification goes out, a lot of VR companies will be able to sell this and use it. They'll benefit people that have a Valve Index, a Valve Index 2 when it comes out, people that have a Quest 2, or maybe, well, maybe not a Quest 2, but another unit headset, any headset. It's, it's good for VR. 44 gigabits per second, that's a lot of data, and that can last for a lot of higher resolutions. Even the Vive Pro 2's resolution would probably benefit from that. In fact, I even expect HTC to release a like second-gen wireless adapter whenever this certification does go through. And yeah, that's that's awesome. Again, Wi-Fi 6, it works great-ish now for Quest 2 users using virtual desktop and AirLink. But again, as resolutions keep getting higher, Wi-Fi 6 is just going to start choking for wireless PC VR. So having these methods such as YGIG 2 is a very big thing for the near future of PC VR wirelessly. Yeah. As for me, a PC VR enthusiast, as soon as that comes out or the certification goes through, I'll probably be making a big post about it again because I've been waiting for this for a while now. It will be a big thing and it'll be great. And I will be sure to buy it right away because I'm freaking obsessed with that garbage. Anyway, that is pretty much everything I have to say about the near future of wireless PC VR or VR in general. I hope you learned something or at least a lot of things about how wireless standards work right now for VR. It's constantly changing, um, except again, we probably won't see anything more than YGIG 2 or anything bigger than YGIG 2 for a while. It takes literally years for these standards to get approved or even caught up with. If you enjoyed this video, I really hope you'll subscribe, hit the like button, even the bell. I have a big you know, video coming up soon talking about how the Valve Index 2 standalone will pro probably work. I do believe the Valve Index 2 will have a standalone unit uh, as an option. And it's going to really do standalone in a way I think a lot of people have no expectation for. And it's going to blow people's minds when that does come. So yeah, keep an eye out for that video. It's kind of like a part two to this. Because standalone is still part of wireless VR. But yeah, bye!